Laura, and thank you everybody for being here and for inviting me. So um, I will talk about a concept that is called ecological intensification of agriculture. Um, basically, my first slide is the conclusion slide, so it's the most important one, and it's very simple. Uh, ecological intensification is based on more biodiversity in the farms and uh, the use of less external inputs. External inputs is everything that comes from outside the farm that you use for producing, like agrochemicals, but also gas. Uh, I I'm going to mention hives, uh, honeybee hives as an example of external inputs. So by, by doing this, using less external inputs and enhancing biodiversity, you can produce more in a more food, better quality of food in a more environmental friendly way. However, as humanity, we are doing exa exactly the opposite. So if you see the graph on the left, you're going to see that uh, uh, year after year, we are having less biodiversity. So a lot of species from any group are uh, going to extinct. And uh, if you see the graph on the right side of the screen, you see there that uh, year after year, we are using more external inputs. And this is exemplified uh, with the use of pesticides. So we from science say that it's possible to produce with more biodiversity and less external inputs. But uh, in practice, we are doing exactly the opposite as a global society and in most of the countries. <clears throat> the fact that we are destroying biodiversity and using more external inputs, not only is a problem of the environment, it's a problem of humanity. So in the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, we classify the benefits of biodiversity to people into 18 categories and we call them nature contributions to people because uh, they can be positive or negative but if you focus on the positive ones uh, within these 18 categories 14 of the 18 have been decreasing during the last decades with negative impacts on good quality of life and as a consequence we are doing very poor progress with the HE biodiversity targets and of course the sustainable development goals. We can discuss more about this uh, later when I finish my talk, if you want. Uh, so I'll, I go and I will move on. <laughs> so why we are using more external inputs like fertilizer, pesticides or hives, as I mentioned earlier, because these external inputs, they provide resources to the crop and then you harvest more seeds or fruits per hectare, and we call that crop yield. And this is a common production function for any agronomist of crop yield as a function of resources. It's, of course, a non-linear uh, decreasing function. And this is one of the fundamental aspects of what we call conventional intensification. Intensification because it's a, progress, it's a process sorry, that takes care about crop yield and which aims to increase a crop yield and conventional because it's based on more external inputs. As a contrast, ecological intensification also share the word intensification because uh, also take care of maintaining or increasing crop yield. But instead of destroying biodiversity, the idea is that you can use more biodiversity to replace external inputs, uh, complement or create synergies between biodiversity and external inputs. So the idea is that the resources that are provided to the crops, like nutrients, they can be provided as ecosystem services through biodiversity, for example, the uh, natural nutrient cycling of soils, or as external input, for example, in this case, a fertilizer. So ecological intensification is an excellent idea. Everybody like it um, because you can produce more 
without destroying biodiversity. Uh, so why people is not uh, doing it? There are many reasons why it's not mainstream currently. Uh, ecological intensification is increasing and expanding year after year, but uh, we, we are far away of being mainstream. And one of the challenges or the limitations of ecological intensification is that uh, local managers to apply the ecological intensification need uh, more ecological knowledge. So nowadays, uh, agriculture is very simple. Uh, the people that, uh, the farmers or the people that are doing agriculture at the field, they don't need to use uh, much ecological knowledge. They apply a receipt and they apply the same receipt in very different type of landscapes. Uh, in contrast to do effectively ecological intensification, you know, you need to learn a little bit more about the, the soil, the ecology of the weeds, also the ecology of the pests, etc. And this is a, a challenge and we are working a lot with the farmers to try to provide this knowledge and uh, um, <clears throat> interact with them at the farm level to make these changes real. So I'm going to exemplify this concept of ecological intensification by using pollen as a resource that the crops need. And again, uh, pollen can be provided as external input through hives of honeybees. We say that hives are external inputs because they come from outside the farm, uh, specifically for uh, po the pollination process. And after that, they are again removed from the farm. Or uh, pollen can be provided naturally by the, as ecosystem services, by the diversity of bees, butterflies, and other wild pollinators that uh, live in the farm. So we wanted to know mm, in real farms of the world, how effective ecological intensification could be. So in each of these uh, blue points that you see in the map, we have uh, several farms applying conventional intensification and several applies, farms, sorry, applying ecological intensification. And we have seen that the uh, farms applying ecological intensification on average can increase crop yield uh, by 24%. That's a lot if you think how much uh, uh, breeding companies work to increase potential yield of the main crops by 1% or 2% in ideal conditions with a lot of fertilizer, etc. So here we work at the farm level and we train some of the farmers into ecological intensification practices. And we have seen that in many different places in the world, despite working with many different crops, uh, ecological intensification work and it can provide a, a very important change in terms of increasing crop productivity. Here in this experiment, we work in the benefits of ecological intensification through the abundance and diversity of bees. So because we follow uh, the same protocol in all the farms and in all the crop systems, we can estimate these uh, production functions that I showed you at the beginning of my talk, but uh, using uh, flower visitors. So we can say, okay, how how many flower visitors we need and <clears throat> how much is going to increase uh, crop yield uh, in the farms. Um, so interesting because we work with real farms, we could uh, also estimate how much was the pollinator gap and how much was the yield gap. And the concept is very similar. We didn't work with extremes, but we did tend and 90 percentile. And we have seen that in both cases, uh, it's around 45%. So despite uh, choosing the, uh, within each region, the same crop, the same system of cultivation, some farmers uh, harvest almost 45% or more than others. And this is partly related with the lack of proper pollination and particular on average, 24% can be increased if we uh, manage a better pollinator. 
So in farmer, but uh, as a society in general, we think that uh, we can destroy biodiversity and the benefits that uh, biodiversity bring to us. And we can replace the loss of biodiversity with external inputs, with human inputs. This is an example that uh, this is not possible, that the quality of the resources that, uh, and the services that biodiversity provides to humanity is not the same as the replacements that we think we have to provide those uh, services. In the case of pollination, so we think that, as you see in, the, in that picture on the right hand of the screen, uh, if we put uh, millions and millions and millions of individuals of only one species, in this case, the honeybee, we can replace the role of a diverse set of wild species. And we have found that that is uh, not correct. And this idea can be applied with many different aspects. So we destroy our soils and we think that we can replace the benefit of healthy soils with, for example, fertilizers. And that is also is not true. And there are many examples uh, regarding that, the idea that the benefits that nature provides to people are not fully replaceable with human inputs. Indeed, in the case of pollinators, if we put too many honeybees, uh, as you see in those graphs, so the x-axis is the amount of honeybees, the fruit set of, on the left and the seed set on the right can even decrease. And if you put too many honeybees, you also have a lot of problems uh, in the environment. And so <clears throat> honeybees are a great species and, and they provide a lot of benefits to humanity. But of course, if you manage badly, you can also damage the, the environment. So with this idea in mind, we provide a protocol that we work with the farmers uh, to estimate these uh, density gaps of pollinators in the flowers. So this is a very simple protocol uh, where we estimate it for each crop in separate. So we have this course for different crops. And the idea is that you make a di diagnosis in the field and you know how many pollinators do you have? And then you know if that is optimal or not according to your crop. So farmers and agronomists, they are very used to uh, monitor the soil, for example, soil nutrients. They also do monitoring of the pest, but nobody does monitoring of the pollination processes. Uh, so in this sense, we also provide some tools to improve uh, farming and also beekeeping uh, practices because many beekeepers nowadays um, they rent uh, hives for crop pollination. So if you want to increase crop yield, especially through better pollinators, uh, better pollination, sorry, you need to manage both species because abundance is also sports, is important, of course, uh, but you also need to manage habitat to provide a diverse set of pollinators. However, again, conventional intensification and we as society are doing the opposite <laughs> in terms of uh, destroying natural habitats. So uh, as you see, conventional intensification is based on large monocultures and we want to be uh, far away as possible from nature, uh, creating homogeneous landscape, as you see in that picture. This, of course, has as a consequence the loss of the diversity of pollinators that they live in these natural or semi-natural habitats. And as a consequence of less uh, diversity of pollinators, you have less pollination that uh, gives less crop yield. Um, because society demands tons in general, so to produce a certain amount of ton, you can increase a crop yield, that is the amount of, you, of uh, food that you harvest per hectare. But if you cannot increase crop yield, you need to expand agricultural land. 
So as a consequence of the lower rate in increasing crop yield, we are expanding at a faster rate agricultural area, especially of those crops that have uh, pollinator deficits. This agricultural area implies less natural habitat because this implies more land conversion and deforestation. So here you have a, a negative cycle where conventional intensification through the loss of natural habitat uh, decreased the diversity of pollinators in the agricultural landscape. This has as a consequence less uh, a mean and stability of pollination, and then you have less crop yield, then more agricultural area. <clears throat> Why is so important this uh, pollinator deficit? Uh, if you think we work with very different crops in many uh, different places in the world, if you remember the map, these were mostly uh, developing countries because most of the food is produced in developing countries, and paradoxically, in these countries is where we know less about uh, ecology in general and ecological intensification in particular. So we've, we found a huge pollinator deficit for many different crops. And this is because conventional intensification is the perfect receipt for a pollinator deficit. A deficit means a uh, unbalance between offer and demand. So on the one side, we create these uh, large monocultures in homogeneous landscape. And this means a lot of pollen demand because uh, the crop flower um, during a brief, brief period of time. And as you see in that photo, these are millions and millions and millions of flowers to pollinate in very little time. Uh, so you have a lot of demand and at the same time, by doing agriculture in this way, we just destroy pollinator diversity. So we don't have offer of pollen to satisfy that demand. As a consequence, the mainstream agricultural practices that are based on conventional intensification uh, produce huge pollinator deficits. So the problem of the lack of natural and semi-natural habitat and the problem of creating homogeneous landscape is not a problem of uh, only uh, <clears throat> the lack of uh, pollinator diversity. This uh, occasionates many, many problems with different uh, nature contributions to people. Because uh, I don't want to be long in this talk, I will only mention another example that is not related to pollinators. So to complement the, the pollinator example. And in the left uh, bottom part of the screen, you see yellow points. These yellow points are points where we measure water table. And in the main graph at the top of the screen, you see that uh, water table has become closer to the surface year after year. And if you see the satellite image at the bottom right of the screen, you see a lot of uh, uh, dark uh, points, and these are flooding events. So because of this way of doing agriculture, we have more flooding. And this has a lot of negative consequences, uh, like we see here. So uh, in the top graph, you see the cultivated area uh through the years and you can see that uh, we have been increased the cultivated area through the years until the maximum around 2010 and after 2010 we decrease cultivated area and that decrease in cultivated area was because this plot could not be cultivated anymore because of excess of water and fluid and this is also related with the idea of creating homogeneous landscapes with monocultures, because now the, the amount of water that the crop uses is much less than the amount of water that uh, the natural or semi-natural habitat used to demand. So as a consequence, water start to accumulate 
and generates reflooding, affecting not only agricultural lands, but also affecting uh, the livelihoods of people. This is an example in uh, one um, province of Argentina, but we have many of these pro uh, problems in many different parts of the world. And in the graph at the bottom of the screen, you can see also the crop yield of our two main crops that are, this is similar in the US with the corn and soybean. And you have seen also, you can see also there that the crop yield has stabilized. So we are not being able to increase crop yield anymore, partly because uh, this uh, negative aspect of convention and intensification. On the contrary, you have just seen that crop yield can be increased through a process of ecological intensification. So the degradation and the negative aspects that conventional intensification is uh, generating are not only evident for the general society as negative externalities like uh, contamination of water with agrochemical, but are also evident for uh, the same farmers that are applying uh, this process. So we need a natural and semi-natural habitat, not only in natural reserves, but also in what we call working landscapes. These working landscapes cover most of our planet. Um, they are used mainly for three activities, agriculture, ranching, and forestry. And these are three activities. Uh, the mainstream process again is convention and intensification that is one species of trees, of cattle or crop, very abundant, creating a homogeneous landscape and a kind of a, a industrialization of uh, farms. So um, we have some targets as a, a global society for the IG biodiversity targets, 11, we have agreed that we need 70% uh, of uh, the work covered by natural reserve, and this applied also for each country. So the 70% of the area of each country should be natural reserve, but there is no agreement about what to do in the rest of, uh, of the world, that is the rest, the, the remaining 83%. And there is no agreement about the functional role for farming, but also for good quality of life of the natural and semi-natural habitats. So we are working a lot of that on that, analyzing also the trade-off, not only the benefits of natural habitat uh, to farming system, but also the trade-off because you have less cultivated area and <clears throat> under different situations, under different uh, climate and stability, soil heterogeneity, etc. And we are taking into account the marginal benefits also of natural habitat. And of course, there is not magic number, but the models and the data are telling us that we need as minimum 20% of native uh, habitat uh, within working landscape, as minimum as minimum 20%, and this 20% does not comprom compromise a uh, crop yield in most instances. So we are working hard with uh, mathematical modeling, especially uh, explicit mathematical models on how to change this type of, of landscape. This is an example that we work in Iowa in the USA. Uh, so you see on the top, the satellite image. Then you see the current situation, and it's mostly brown because it's everything is planted with corn. You see some water uh, there, and and some light green next to the water. That um, it means some uh, remnants of grasslands. So we, through models, we design how to. Uh, move from the current situation to the target situation of at least 20% of uh, natural and semi-natural habitat. So where uh, to put these press strips 
uh, what are going to be the benefits, etc. And so in the photo below, you can see that example is for soybeans, but you can see how uh, the crop uh, is uh, mixed with these uh, strips of native prayers, and this has a lot of benefits for reducing soil erosion, uh, increasing the diversity of birds, pollinators, etc. Uh, you can also see how this uh, the design of a farmer is different. We are obsessed with the squares. We like to always uh, sow in squares, but the <laughs> topography of our landscapes uh, does not come in squares. So that also brings us a lot of problems. So the idea is also to change in a more intelligent way how we sow the crops. So currently in the world there are almost 2 billion hectares that are mostly crop. Uh, so where cropland area covers more than 80% of the land and this uh, minimum of 20% is not achieved. And you can see where is that in red and a lot is in the US, in the corn belt, and also in our pampas in Argentina. And here you can see the landscape that uh, are going in that trajectory. And this is almost 10 billion hectares. So um, most of the croplands are being increasingly homogenized. And so we apply these models to different examples in the world, like canola in Brazil or soybeans in Argentina, wheat in France, and bocado in Australia, and always try to design the, the best combination uh, of um, natural and semi-natural habitats to provide existing services and the restore farming landscape. We have been also working hard in reviewing uh, the current uh, legislation all over the world. Um, and we have seen that uh, only 38% of the countries, uh, they have legislation to protect um, natural, semi-natural habitats uh, within uh, their countries as a national legislation. So you can see, for example, Europe, it's in a yellow color. And it, that means that uh, as a, a continent, they have a minimum of 5% natural and semi-natural habitat. Then this can increase according to certain regulations of some countries. Uh, Brazil has a 20% of a minimum. Uh, and in the Amazon forest is 80% of minimum. And the world situation is the dark brown, like in Argentina, where we don't have a specific legislation for working landscapes. Uh, the other color than the one in the US, uh, it means that you have um, <clears throat> some legislation to protect uh, these uh, native habitats within working landscape, but there is no minimum uh, percentage required. Of course, it's not uh, with the percentage, it's not a not. Uh, it's very important the quality of this uh, remnant of natural or semi-natural habitats, the configuration, how you, are you going to uh, maintain this habitat within the landscape, and also the, the, the time frame, because in many instances, it takes time to, um, to produce these kind of habitats. Uh, some key aspect to take into account is that, for example, if you're going to provide a habitat for crop pollinators, the natural habitat need to be within 200 meters of the crop because most of the uh, pollinators don't fly uh, farther away than that. And that means a, a, a radio of 200 meters, and it, this is an area of 15 hectares. Uh, so in some places like Europe, this is okay, but in other places like Argentina or even the, the US, uh, one plot of soybeans uh, is more than 1,000 hectares. So this means 
a different configuration of agriculture that is currently performed. So in the top uh, part of the screen, you can see a, a photo from the US. This is a new plantings of almonds. And you can see there are a, a strip in the middle that is planned to provide the habitat for pollinators. So enterprises are starting to take into account these ideas of a conserved a natural and semi-natural habitats within farmland. But we are still in the beginning of the process of application these uh, practices in the world, despite there are many uh, positive examples. Uh, the amount of people and uh, farmers and enterprises that are applying these kind of practices is not enough. So conventional intensification creates a negative cycle. This negative cycle can be changed into a positive one through ecological intensification in a way that you improve the environment for uh, pollinators in this case and the idea of ecological intensification is exemplified for pollinators. So you, you give pollinators a better environment and place to nest and you give diversity of flowers, you give food for them. In that way you improve the amount and quality of pollen in crop flowers and in this way you increase crop production. So ecological intensification as I told you in my first slide means more biodiversity and less external input. And this concept can be applied to different uses of the agricultural landscape. And we can uh, simplify the type of uses of an agricultural landscape in only three. You see there the natural habitat, as I told you before. So I have been talking a while already for about natural habitat. So there, the idea is to increase the diversity of native uh, plants and animals and to use less external inputs. But you can apply also the idea, the same idea to the crop. So to increase the diversity of cultivated plants and to use less pesticide and also to the hedge, uh, which are in many instances a uh, important habitat for pollinators and also other ecosystem services uh, providers. So I will go briefly through the other type of land uses. We already talked about uh, natural habitats. I will talk uh, very briefly now about crop, just to show you another example that we have been working with. So there you see a sunflower crop. Uh, at the top, you see a photo of a sunflower field with some weeds. And in the bottom, you see a photo of sunflower field without any weed. So probably the farmer will be proud of the photo at the bottom. So uh, sunflowers without any weed. And we compare uh, a lot of farms without weeds and some farms where we convince uh, farmers to leave some weeds uh, within the, the sunflowers so to a place a little bit less of herbicides. So then you have less external input and more biodiversity by increasing the diversity of plants within the crop. And that is uh, what you see there in the uh, bipartite networks that are next to the photos. So you see the plant below and the pollinators above. And we have two networks as an average of different farms. So of course, uh, for the situation with wheat, uh, the most abundant plant is the sunflower because it's a sunflower field. But you see that you have uh, blue lines that these are the weeds. In the bottom part, you have mostly sunflower and only one blue line, so only one species of wheat. And you see that uh, in the situation without wheat, you only have uh, honeybees uh, visiting the sunflower. And in contrast, in the top part, you have honeybees and a lot of different species of wild insects. And the honeybees and the wild insects, they are attracted into the sunflower field by the weeds. So have, having the weeds there is positive because 
attract pollinators and once they are within the field they also visit sunflower and you can see also that with weeds you have even more honeybees than without weeds and paradoxically you see uh, in the regression line below that uh, the amount of sunflower seeds that you harvest increase with the amount of species of weeds that you have. So opposite to what uh, most people would think, more weeds in this case mean more crop yield. Of course, is a certain practice of reducing herbicide and increasing not strongly the amount of weeds in a period that is not critical for the sunflower. But it still is also more profitable because on the one side you have more income because you have more seeds and the other ha hand you have less cost because you apply less uh, agrochemical, less herbicide. So here is another example of the edge. This is a photo in California in the US. So you have a, an almond there and uh, you see that uh, before is uh, the, top, the photo in the top part of the screen. Uh, every piece of land, even if you're going to harvest or not, is uh, with labor and it's also being applied uh, agrochemicals unnecessary. So we took a, a small edge of the land that uh, does not compromise the area with the crop. And five years after that, you see these rubbed shrubs that uh, are native, they are flowering and they provide habitat for pollinators and the pollinators established there and from there they pollinate the almonds on the right side and uh, the crop on the left side that in this case were tomatoes that they are also have a dependency on pollinators. So through more biodiversity and less external inputs there are ways to increase crop yield, but it's not only about crop yield. Uh, ecological intensifications have long-term, not only short-term benefits, and not uh, in multiple dimensions, so beyond crop yield. And these dimensions, as I told you before, can be related, for example, with the water regulation and uh, preventing floodings that uh, damage people livelihood. Also, the, these practices, they contribute with uh, other ecosystem services like uh, not recycling provided by the biodiversity of death rewards or, or pest regulation provided by the diversity of natural enemies. And so we review the, the literature regarding this uh, interaction between different ecosystem services. And we have found that uh, there are no negative interactions between different ecosystem services. So if you do practices of ecological intensification to improve the habitat for pollinators, this will have non effects for other ecosystem services or most likely will have a synergistic effects with other ecosystem services. And this is what we found uh, in this uh, review. Uh, interesting, this aspect of the interaction of the different ecosystem services on crop yield is a new area of research. There are only 16 studies providing only 20 two-way interactions to analyze. And most of these studies, they have been performed in the last uh, two decades. Um, another dimension of benefit is also for stability the stability of crop yield, but also the stability in many different ecosystem services and, and properties of the ecosystem. Here it is exemplified with the crop yield. And you can see from uh, top to bottom, from left to right, in, it increased the deficit of pollinators that the crop have. And you can see that uh, uh, the stability of crop yield from one year to the next one is uh, much lower when you increase pollinator deficit because of the lack of diversity of pollinators. Uh, we have also reviewed these uh, multiple benefits and 
uh, there was very little information regarding general socioeconomic indicators and very little information in the long term. Most of the information was for crop yield and for profits and in an opposite ways to what people thought, ecological intensification increase, the amount of harvest per hectare, and also, as I told you before, increase also profits because in uh, this uh, sometimes increase in income through more crop yield is also associated to a reduction in cost. So we say that conventional intensification uh, use very little knowledge, but is very intensive in the use of external input. On the contrary, ecological intensification is more intensive in the use of ecological knowledge, but it is less intensive in the use of external input. As another example of the multiple dimensions of benefit, and taking into account this aspect that I told you before that where we have a knowledge gap that is the socioeconomic indicators, one of these indicators is jobs. And this is very important for people like you, and many presidents based the, their campaign in uh, providing more uh, jobs. So we hypothesize that the landscapes with high crop diversity, as you see in the top part of the screen, will provide a high diversity of employment needs and then will increase employment. On the contrary, a low diversity of agricultural landscape, as you see on the bottom part of the screen, will have a low diversity of employment needs and will have decreased amount of employment. This uh, will also benefit other economic activities like uh, beekeeping or tourists because of uh, less uh, negative externalities from conventional intensification. As I told you before, ecological intensification is based of more biodiversity and of course if you increase crop diversity is also a way to increase uh, biodiversity. And our results were in agreement with this we work in many different places, uh, countries in the world, and uh, through time series, and we measure more than 20 different co-variables that were also influencing uh, jobs like uh, uh, technological innovation or uh, population growth, uh, um, the, the amount of um, GDP, that is a growth domestic product, the increase in the GDP, and many, many different socioeconomic indicators. And we found that uh, there is an independent effect of diversity. So if you increase diversity of crops, you increase employment, and this effect is not confounded with many other aspects also influencing jobs. As uh, just an example, uh, if you compare two countries, this is just an example to give you an idea. This comparison it's also is of course biased because we are only comparing two countries, but the previous analysis is not biased. So here you see Argentina in 1999 and Chile in 1999. You see that uh, Chilean agriculture was more, di more diverse in 1999. And through the years until uh, 2013, Chile uh, increased a little bit um, uh, its diversity of crops. On the contrary, you see in the top part of the screen that Argentina uh, continue to decrease the, the crop diversity. So to give you an idea of the importance of how designing agricultural landscape, landscape can be to a national economy, you see there that 10,000 hectares in Argentina provides only 25 jobs. In contrast, in Chile, 10,000 hectares provide 6,700 jobs. Uh, so this is a massive difference. So by designing more agroecological landscape, we can provide a real jobs to people. So be friendly landscape are also human friendly. And we are working uh, a lot in this concept of ecological intensification with different 
farming cooperatives and farming enterprise and helping them to include these uh, targets of increasing diversity each year, each year after year and reducing external inputs. And also we generate a certification of biodiversity that help farmers uh, to enter this process of uh, enhancing biodiversity. So uh, as a uh, last slide, if uh, I'm asked, okay, what are the uh, main policy targets for ecological intensification that are science-based? These are 10 targets that they can be applied at different level, at the municipality level, at the state level, at the country level, uh, as a recommendation for the different uh, policy makers and stakeholders. Um, and finally, uh, a little bit uh, of our institute and our focus is uh, working on predictive and management oriented science. So through the mathematical models that we work, we want to know, okay, how much biodiversity do we need, where, when. We want to understand the long-term consequences on multiple dimensions focusing not only on crop yield, but also on good quality of life. We want to uh, employ the latest uh, technological advances and uh, conceptual development by using a spatial temporal multi aging based models for landscape design. So this idea of design landscape that account for benefit and cost of different land use options is something uh, new that ecology can provide as a tool to farmers and society in general. And we work uh, with the uh, land manager, beekeepers, consumers, and policy makers to try to make these things uh, real. Well, thank you very much, and I'm open to questions. Dr. Garibaldi, thank you so much for such an excellent presentation and for being able to join us today. With that said, we can jump over to questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Feel free to pop those questions in the chat so we can call out to you. And already I see two questions from Sammy. Sammy, feel free to unmute if you'd like. Yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask about the 17% seven, rule that you mentioned earlier. And if the 17% rule regarding the natural reserves is prevalent in all countries or in the United States. You mean the IG target? Yes. The IG target is for every country that uh, signed the IG targets and the US also signed. So yeah, it's for the US, but also for Canada, Mexico, Argentina. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next up we have Jonathan. Hi, start my video. Hi Lucas, great talk, thank you so much. Um, I actually have a different question than what I typed. At one point you mentioned something about farm managers, um, how it could be beneficial if they monitored their pollinator populations. And I'm wondering if you're, in your experience, do you, do you know if farm managers show, are showing any interest in doing that? Are they interested in actually monitoring their own specific pollinator populations? Uh, are they willing to pay for something like that versus you know, the opposite where they can just pay beekeepers to come in. Um, is that something that you, in your experience, that you notice with, with managers? Uh, interest is increasing mm. and willingness is also increasing, but of course uh, it's not mainstream. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you show the data that is viable, uh, of course, uh, you usually start with the innovative farmers. <laughs> uh, 
not uh, the ones that uh, they are more open-minded. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then uh, after a couple of years, others may shun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's something that basically must take a long time to get everybody on board. Yeah. <laughs> Slow and steady. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so Kara doesn't have a question, but she has an answer. I don't know if she wants to unmute to talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I certainly don't have, you know, the answer. I don't think anybody does in terms of how best to drive behavioral change, you know, from the innovation side of things. But we have some lessons learned from other fields that I think may be relevant. Um, you could actually do some interviews with different farmers or different stakeholders involved um, in a certain setting and talk to them about the challenges that they face, let's say, to, uh, to operating more sustainably. And you can hear directly from them, like in terms of what barriers they face or what um, incentives could work for them to drive behavioral change. We know that in other fields, usually there's like a combination of like um, a carrot and a stick that can help drive behavioral changes. So for some motivated individuals, you know, they'll be uh, interested in the carrot and they'll go after it, but other individuals may be more um, effective using the stick or like policy regulatory changes as well. So there's kind of this combination that we've seen. There's, I don't know all the details, but I know in Florida, um, some beneficial uh, practices have been conducted around uh, nutrient applications in the Ever Everglades. So I think uh, farmers have been incentivized to use best management practices to reduce the amount of uh, nutrients that they apply that end up benefiting everybody else from less runoff. So that's like one kind of poster child example of how to dr drive effective change um, using best management practices. Maybe it could be relevant for your field as well. Yeah, thank you. Next up, we have Elsa. Hi, thanks. Um, enjoyed the talk. I also had a question um, while Jonathan was asking his, uh, this also occurred to me um, and during your talk, but I'm, I love the idea of monitoring for pollinators, um, but it does seem distinct from the precedents that you mentioned of like monitoring soil quality or monitoring sort of specific pests for threshold densities when with pollination, I mean, the easy analog is stocking densities of honeybees, like the one species, but when what you want to target is a particular composition or diversity that are providing the target service, that seems harder to monitor, especially for kind of farmers who are also monitoring for all that other stuff and don't have time to become experts in bees. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you envision with that and if there are precedents for like diversity monitoring or how that might work. Yeah, so um, the protocol is pretty simple just to look at the flowers and count the amount of bees uh, during a certain time. Uh, and uh, you don't need to be a taxonomist. So if you just can separate honeybees from the rest of, of pollinators, just the, the dominance of honeybees can be a good indicator. So, so in the same way that you monitor um, pest damage or nutrients in the soil, you also need to monitor uh, uh, bees in the flowers. So, the hives we have seen in many papers that is not a very good indicator of pollination. And one hive can have 10,000 bees or, uh, or 80,000 bees. And they can have different structure of brood cells, etc. They can be attracted to the crop or not. So, so idea of uh, recommending hives is not a best management practice. Uh, 
So of course we work with the standardized hives in many places where, where we do pollination, but still uh, the, the rate of uh, visitation is, uh, is not uh, so strongly tied with the amount of hives that you have in a field. And also the hives can be close to the crop or not. Uh, so um, I see in farming that uh, there are a lot of things currently uh, applied in the field that are more complex than just looking flowers. So uh, if uh, managers uh, value the idea that they need optimal pollination, they will do it because they, they are already doing things that are m much more complex. Thanks. So next up we have Brad Taylor. And I have a question I think that follows along a little bit um, uh, from Elsa's question, but it relates to number eight on your list um, of like the top 10 things that should be done that you had near the end. And I was wondering whether people have been doing long term monitoring of ecosystem services following, um, you know, changes in habitat, you know, modification and how much variation is there over time? Or as also was mentioning, do you see some sort of threshold that's reached and then you don't see much variation after that? Uh, so um, the number eight says, uh, evaluate agricultural productivity and ecosystem services over the long term. So, um, as um, I show in a previous slide where I showed the, um, the review about the benefit of ecological intensification, uh, we found almost no evidence on the long term. So um, this is something uh, new that should be done uh, for the crops. So there are very little uh, monitoring uh, of ecosystem services. We do have monitoring of uh, agricultural productivity in the long term. And we are working a lot with those databases uh, and using our models to understand how landscapes that are more friendly to the environment also provide more stable, stable agricultural productivity through years. Many farmers use nowadays uh, phone apps and they register there the, the each plot, uh, the amount of harvest in each plot, the, uh, the disease, the weeds, everything. And we are used, we are working with these companies uh, that they have all this information and we want to use our model to um, to try to design more environmentally friendly ways to, to do agriculture with real data. I don't know if I answer your question. But, yeah. Yes, great. That was great. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Ambar, do you want to close this out? Hmm. Yes, I think Brad was unmuting to ask a question, I think. Uh, we got, we got Brad. I think Becky was disguised as Brad. Yes, I was disguised as Brad. So you're all set. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we have reached the end of the seminar. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Garibaldi, for joining us as well. Um, please stick, um, be, be on the lookout for those emails, promotions from the B Seminar, for those announcements for the next talks. So thank you so, so much.